हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू शरद चंद्र आई एस अकेडमी आई एम अमरनाथ इन दिस वीडियो वी विल डिस्कस द क्वेश्चन आज इन यूपीएससी मेन्स ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू लेट एस गो टू दस्ट क्वेश्चन द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज अबाउट सुप्रीम कोर्ट द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज ऑन सुप्रीम कोर्ट एंड द इम्पैक्ट ऑफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑन development of modern law that is how supreme court judgments are shaping the modern law that is the uh, essence of the question so here the uh, focal point of the question is on constitutionalization of environmental problems so this is what the point constitutionalization of environmental problems by supreme court that is how supreme court judgments has constitutionalized the uh, the environmental problems right so we need to discuss this question by using relevant case laws all right so how supreme court judgments has led to development of constitutional law particularly on the environmental issues right so so these supreme court judgments on one hand they have provided rights to the individuals so these uh, judgments they have conferred a right to the individual At the same time these judgments have also imposed a duty on the individuals right so there is a two fold impact of supreme court judgments one on providing rights and the other one on the providing a duty to the government so uh, a very good answer should start with constitutional provisions of this issue so we can find the constitutional provisions in article 21 that is A fundamental rights as well as in directive principles of state policy so article 21 so which uh, which talks about right to life and liberty so every citizen of this nation has been guaranteed of right to life and liberty so supreme court judgments has widened the scope of this right to life and liberty particularly by providing right to healthy environment right so this right to life and liberty the scope of article 21 got widened by this uh, right to life uh, healthy environment similarly we have article 48a so article 48a talks about duty of the state to protect and safeguard forest and environment so there is a duty on the state at the same time there is a right of the individual so let us talk about the uh, landmark judgments which have really shaped the constitutional law right so the first of such judgment is dehradun valley litigation so it is this litigation it is the, uh, in this case supreme court gave a judgment which led to emergence of environmental protection act of 1986 which is a landmark act right and every individual today they have a right to uh, get pollution free water and air so right to life and liberty includes right a uh, pollution free water and air so this was uh, given by supreme court in subhash kumar versus state of bihar case so another landmark judgment right is mc mehta versus union of india case right so which has again provided every individual the right from uh, right to pollution free environment particularly on the mining industries so supreme court also gave a judgment uh, what do you call uh, on this uh, in this uh, mc mehta case which led to conservation of uh, river ganga taj mahal so right so this is how the up uh, the uh, supreme court the supreme court has enlarged enlarged the modern law by its judgments so the conclusion of this question is right so we can uh, assertively say that the supreme court the supreme court by its judgments right so it has enhanced it has brought changes in the in the in the modern law particularly by constitutionalizing them right so this should be the answer for this question so here the focus of the answer should be on this case laws right so explaining explaining development of constitutional law by using this case studies let us move to the next question so coming to second question the second question is again on 
fundamental rights that is the question revolves around uh, article 19 that is freedom of uh, freedom of free movement as well as freedom of residence right so let me read the question once a right of movement and residence throughout the territory of india are freely available to the citizens to the indian citizens but these rights are not absolute right so question is totally about the freedom of free movement and residence so our answer should start from article 19 that is article 19 e and article 19 f so article 19 e and article 19 f has provided this freedom to move freely in any part of india right article 19 f provides freedom to reside in any part of india so though there are freedoms given in the constitution but these freedoms are not absolute because right these uh, these freedoms are enjoyed only in certain conditions in other words there can be a restrictions that can be imposed on this freedom so they are not absolute because they can be restricted and these conditions are clearly spelled out in the constitution so the question revolves around right to highlight that conditions so when a con uh, when a restrictions can be placed on the freedom of movement as well as residence right so we all know that right the restrictions can be imposed on this uh, on this freedom whenever there is right violation of general interest interest of the general public so violation of interest of general public that is any kind of movement which uh, leads to uh, what you call uh, uh, which may create a disturbance or which will lead to uh, uh, which may lead to disturbance to public order right which may uh, lead to a uh, violence so in that conditions there can be a restrictions imposed so we need to highlight this point so we need to explain this point that is whenever there is a uh, whenever there is an impact on interest of general public whenever there is a violation of whenever there is a violation of interest of any scheduled tribe in the name of public health that is we have seen due, uh, due to times of uh, covid particularly in uh, uh, times of lockdown so there is a restriction imposed on uh, movement of the individual right so when there is right general interest that is the public morality is involved right so even bombay high court has given a judgment right imposing restrictions on those people who are infected by uh, hiv and supreme court has justified these restrictions right there is a restriction on the movement of those people who are involved in flesh trade right that is prostitutes so that is even these restrictions is justified so that means though every individual in conclusion in conclusion we should say that though the constitution provides rights and freedoms to the citizens these rights and freedoms are not absolute no nation provides absolute freedoms right so there is a police power given to the state these police powers are exercised by state whenever there is violation of these conditions that means there is a rights on one hand and there is what you call restrictions on these rights so this is about the third question right so third question third question is all about third question is all about using these restrictions right so explaining the restrictions on article 19 let us move to the third question the third question is on local bodies the third question is on decentralization of power the focal point of this is the impact of decentralization of power on governance to what extent in your opinion has the decentralization of power in india changed the governance landscape at the grassroots all right so it is an opinion based to what extent to what extent all right this decentralization has changed the governance landscape particularly at the grassroots levels all right so here we need to bring out we need to bring out the uh, uh, importance of decentralization so here we can use the concept of good governance that is we can start the answer from the concept of good governance because 
one of the elements of good governance is people participation this people participation is possible this people participation is possible only with right decentralization so without decentralization it is not possible to have people participation and the initiatives taken in india right in this regard that is in promoting decentralization so uh, right from 1953 54 that is from the constitution of balwantrai mehta committee ashok mehta committee then right uh, yeah, we have um, uh, uh, many committees notably it is these committees right then uh, lm singhi committee and enactment of 73rd and 74th amendment acts right uh, and this enforcement of 73rd and 74th amendment acts from 24th april 1993 so it is this 73rd 74th amendment acts which has totally changed the what do you call the governance system right so we should start our answer from this point of uh, the uh, 73rd 74th amendment act so in our first para in our introductory para we need to highlight right uh, this uh, importance of significance of 73rd 74th amendment acts the main objective of this 73rd 74th amendment acts then a different government uh, initiatives right different government initiatives right in strengthening in strengthening what do you call are uh, this uh, local bodies right so uh, then a uh, different types of schemes which really implemented by uh, pri institutions that is uh, schemes like nrega then all right so uh, rural water schemes prime minister uh, gram sadak yojana so we can use these kind of examples to show that uh, local bodies decentralization of power is really essential for effective implementation of public policies effective implementation of public programs and ensure people participation in the governance so not only increasing efficiency and effectiveness in program implementation as well as to act as a rural development engines but at the same time it is this decentralization of power which also ensures responsiveness and transparency in the governance so we can also see that is we can we should we should also highlight the importance of this decentralization in promoting responsiveness and transparency so that means right so uh, this decentralization definitely is an initiative that really brought a uh, 360 degree change in the governance landscape right so so we are accepting and we should accept it we should accept the importance of this decentralization but at the same time we should also highlight some of the loopholes or the challenges in this working of decentralized governance say for example the power sharing the power sharing between the elected representatives and the people right so the kind of uh, what do you call a uh, 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 a kind of shield between the uh, political system and the people all right so we need to highlight even these kind of uh, issues say the uh, governmental indifference right another problem that is so uh, still in certain areas still in certain pockets of the country right there is indifference by the government machinery that means though there is a institution of pris so these pris are not implemented in their true spirits that is the, there is no effective participation of uh, people no conducting of elections regularly there is that is there is no periodic elections been conducted bureaucratization of these democratic institutions right so the conflicts between the local politicians and bureaucrats particularly the grassroots the, the 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 political system working at the grassroots level right so the domination shown by this grassroots level politicians on the bureaucrats right so we need to highlight uh, these kind of uh, challenges right so uh, uh, persistent force excited by the local interest groups so we have different types of interest groups region religion caste business groups right so <coughs> so there are a uh, different uh, kind of interest groups which are exerting pressure on the local bodies <coughs> right so that means on one hand we, we are showing the importance of this decentralized governance particularly in 
promoting the governance at the same time we also need to highlight these challenges right so but ultimately we should conclude this answer in a positive note that is we should also say, uh, we should always accept that decentralized governance is an engine of good governance it is the watchword of present day governance so right we should end our answer in a positive note by highlighting the importance of decentralized institutions are what this uh, grassroots level institutions right so this is about the third question let us now move towards fourth question <clears throat> fourth question which revolves around the role of vice president as chairperson right remember the question is very specific the question is about role of vice president but it is with respect to rajya sabha the question is about role of vice president with respect to rajya sabha that is as a chairperson that means here we need not to highlight the role of vice president as an acting president of india so there are uh, multiple roles played by vice president but the question is specific the question is about role of vice president in acting as chairperson of rajya sabha that means our answer should restrict only to this element of chairperson so before going to this uh, uh, answer question so we should start our answer from article 64 all right so it is this article 64 of constitution which makes vice president of india as ex officio chairperson of rajya sabha so what are different roles played by uh, uh, vice president as chairperson remember as a chairperson of rajya sabha vice president has similar roles as that of speaker of lok sabha but not all the roles remember it is not about all the roles it is similar to speaker of lok, uh, lok sabha but there are certain changes so we need to write the functions of what you call uh, what you call uh vice president at the same time we should also uh, we should also bring the a uh, difference between speaker and lok sabha in one or two lines all right so as a chairperson of uh, uh rajya sabha it is a chairperson who presides the house so the every proceedings the every proceedings of the house is presided by uh, the uh, chairperson right he will uh, preside over the meetings of the house right and he uh, he is the ultimate guardian of privileges of the house so he is a guardian of collective privileges right so right he is the one right uh, who secures the rights of the members of rajya sabha protects the right of the rajya sabha as well as rights of the members he is the one who interprets all the rules including the rules of parliament the rules of what you call uh, rajya sabha as well as interpreting the constitutional laws so chairperson of rajya sabha is the sole interpreter all right he is the one as i said he maintains the dignity of the house all right so these are the uh, some of the functions which are uh, performed by chairperson of rajya sabha so even we can also talk all right uh, in the uh, appointment of panel of members it is the uh, uh, it is the rajya sabha chairperson all right who will cast is board in case of tie that is same as speaker of lok sabha even the rajya sabha chairperson has right the casting board that is in case of tie of boards it is rajya sabha chairperson who will uh, cast his vote right so these are the some of the functions which are performed by chairperson of rajya sabha so our answer should be limited only to this level only to this functions right so this is what about and here one point i have missed to say along with article 64 also do quote the uh, do quote the rules of rajya sabha as source of power of chairperson that means not only article 64 but even the rules of rajya sabha provides the powers and authority for the chairperson of rajya sabha so our answer should start from that uh, point and we should write uh, these uh, presiding functions right then acting as a guardian Act, uh, maintaining the collective order individual uh, rights interpretation of rules chairperson of the business advisory committee of rajya sabha 
he is the it is the chairperson of Rajya Sabha who will uh, uh, who will determine and design the business of the house. All right. So it is he who will uh, decide on the uh, zero hours within Rajya Sabha. So uh, these are different functions performed by chairperson of Rajya Sabha. Right. So this is what about uh, fourth question. Next coming to the fifth question. So fifth question, all right, is about role of national commission on backward classes. But the highlight of this question is, it is not just about the role of uh, NCBC, national commission for backward classes. The issue is, right, so what is the role change, role change of this commission after getting constitutional status? Previously, UPSC has asked question on national commission for minorities just uh, two years back now it is a question on national commission for backward classes same question was asked constitutional status to national committee for minority commission this was a question asked in 2018 or 19 i'm, I'm not sure it was uh, in uh, two years back now the question is on constitutional status to national commission for backward classes so how this role uh, uh, how this uh, constitutional status to this uh, institution brought a role change so we need to highlight this point that is we need to highlight the role change of national commission for backward classes so any answer so the good answer starts from the 1992 uh, judgment of supreme court in indra shane versus union of india case so it is in this case supreme court brought out the need for constituting a separate institutional mechanism to safeguard the interest of right the backward classes so we all know the importance of Indra Shana case. So it is in this case, Supreme Court gave uh, uh, reservations for OBCs up to a tune of 25, uh, 27 percentage. Now, as a part of this, it even recommended a right constitution of an institutional mechanism. All right. So, all right, 123rd Constitutional Amendment Bill, right, which was passed as 102 Constitutional Amendment Act. So it is this 102nd Constitutional Amendment Act that has given a constitutional status to the National Commission for Backward Classes. So that is, before this 102nd Amendment Act, it was just a statutory body. So after this Amendment Act, this commission has become right, a constitutional body. So as a statutory body, it has no power. It has a limited power. Simply, it has a limited power. So before that, it was only concerned with, all right, uh, it is only concerned with uh, exclusion or uh, inclusion or exclusion of uh, different caste groups into the list of OBCs. So, the role of NCBC was confined only to the inclusion, inclusion and exclusion of all right, OBC uh, uh, caste groups, that is, modification of OBC list. That is the only role. All right. So it will uh, uh, it will undertake research. Uh, it will undertake research. It will uh, data, it, uh, it will study the social economic census. So based upon this research and study of this social economic census, earlier that is before this one second amendment act, OBC was involved only in right updating the OBC list. But now it is different. So after this constitutional status to OBC, there is a change. That means it acquired all the powers of a civil court. It can order into inquiry, it can order inquiry, it can conduct inquiry, it can conduct investigation on all the cases of violation of rights of OBCs. All right? So, it has a duty, it has a constitutional duty of safeguarding the constitutional rights given to the OBCs. All right? So, it has all the powers of a civil court, right? Because of which it can summon any public servant. It can call for any kind of document, right? So it can uh, it can receive any kind of complaint, right? So at the same time, it has an important role of right recommending the governments, right, in making policies, programs, as well as bringing up different statutory mechanisms for the protecting the interests and rights of OBCs. So this is the role change, mainly right conducting inquiry, investigation. Uh, uh, using uh, enjoying the powers of a civil court, calling up, uh, calling uh, uh, for any kind of public document, summoning a public servant, 
so these are the new powers that are given to national commission for obcs after this constitutional amendment so before this amendment actually these powers on obcs was enjoyed by national commission for scheduled caste so before this amendment these powers are enjoyed by national commission for scheduled caste but after this one or second amendment right now these powers are enjoyed by national commission for obcs right so it has a duty of providing annual reports to president so this is the role change role change from statutory body to constitutional body of obc uh, uh, obc right coming to sixth question the sixth question is on gati shakti yojana right so gati gati shakti yojana right needs a meticulous coordination between the government and private sector to achieve the goal of connectivity right so here the question revolves around the basic challenge in the implementation of gati shakti yojana the basic challenge is right coordinating different stakeholders right so here different stakeholders is right we it is within the intergovernmental coordination one is inter governmental coordination right not only this coordination with the private sector right so this is the basic challenge in implementation of gati shakti yojana so our answer should highlight this right problem of bringing coordination the challenges for bringing coordination so our first part of the that is our core part of the answer should revolve around challenges in bringing coordination right so here we can start our answer as a part right from the national logistic policy right so the recent budget initiative of national infrastructure pipeline national infrastructure pipeline because the government of india has given highest allocation to this national infrastructure uh, pipeline so to implement this what you call infrastructure projects in india right we need coordination among different ministries particularly so if you take this what you call gati shakti yojana it is a digital platform connecting almost all 16 ministries so we are just talking about ministries what about different departments what about different what about different autonomous agencies right so ministries departments right autonomous agencies involved within this right for having right, meticulous planning and execution of infrastructure projects so here this gati shakti program right is to ensure right a, 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 what you call a meticulous planning and implementation of all the infrastructure projects particularly in promoting the connectivity so for example national highways roadways shipping department right so we have what you call uh, different ministries right different stakeholders in this right now right through cross sectoral what you call a uh, prioritization right through cross sectoral interactions so this is what about the basic introduction of the answer but our answer should uh, should focus on challenges so what is the basic challenge bureaucratic coordination right bureaucratic coordination between public and private sector right legal system right uh, framing the appropriate legal system right it is another uh, framework uh, it is uh, it is another challenge right clearly specifying the roles of public sector and private sector this is third challenge right availability of data lack of information and data which are very vital for smooth functioning of what you call uh, gati shakti yojana so there should be there should be importance to be given to the providing of clear information as well as data right so bureaucratic challenges lack of information lack of uh, data right lack of uh, what you call enabling uh, legal environment lack of even we can uh, use the incentives to the private sector right so these are different uh, challenges in bringing coordination so focus should be on bringing coordination in order to have effective implementation of gati shakti yojana right so this should be the crux of the answer so this is a question asked in general studies paper 2 question number 7 that is a question about rights of persons with disabilities 
right question on rights of persons with disabilities act 2016 the question states that so this act remains just a legal document if there is no sensitization of government and citizens all right so the question revolves around the element of all right sensitization of government and citizens that means for effective implementation of this act for effective enjoyment of the rights given by this act the government as well as the citizens need to be sensitized they need to be educated particularly the people the society need to be educated about the problems the challenges faced by the disabled right that is by differently abled right so the question revolves around the kind of sensitization that is required so to know this all right so first of all we should start our answer from this 2016 act so the kind of rights given by this act that is the rights given by persons with disabilities act or the rights of persons with disabilities act 2016 prenatal care postnatal care reserve, uh, providing of separate quota in employment in education right in skill development right so these persons with disabled they have their own rights in education employment skill training apart from prenatal as well as postnatal care right so now unless we know the limitations of this right we cannot we cannot understand uh, or we cannot recommend the kind of sensitization program so by using these limitations let us go uh, let us recommend these sensitization programs so if you take this all right uh, the challenges here the limitations here all right Uh, these the benefits of this so uh, what you call uh, act the benefits of this act are not reaching they are not reaching to the exact beneficiary that is still still all right the differently abled people they don't have awareness about all the rights so it is the duty of the society to increase awareness to learn about this act to know about this act and educate the people who are with differently ability with different abilities right so another problem is another problem is right comprehensiveness of this act right so it this act this act lacks this act lacks comprehensiveness as well as right it is uh, uh, it does not addresses all the socio psychological problems of the disabled right so the focus should be on the focus should be on understanding the psychological issues of the disabled persons right the social issues of disabled persons so more than physical more than physical it is the psychological and social challenges that these disabled persons uh, face right so it is the duty of this society to uh, 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 to design a mechanism of promoting the psychological health health of the differently able right so right lack of information right so lack of adequate information is another challenge that we can see among the people with differently able right then right existence of uh, existence of um, uh, what you call uh, multiple multiple mechanisms or need to go around multiple institutions for enjoying these rights that means there is a need to have a single window mechanisms so that the disabled can enjoy their rights so it is the duty of the government the duty of the government to provide all the kind of certificates all the kind of benefits at one place so right so the basic issue is roaming around uh, uh, roaming around different departments or roaming, uh, roaming around different public agencies for getting the certification going around different kind of tests all right so there is a challenge in getting the certification right so as a disabled right the individuals have difficulty in having all these clearances in one single place right so uh, the government as well as society should understand this issue that is this another problem right so there is no single formula there is no single formula right to provide all these kinds of benefits so there should be uniformity of 
uh, there should be uniform formula or there should be uniform principle that should be used in providing the benefits to different types of disabled right different type of, for different uh, categories of disabled right so now these recommendations these recommendations are particularly directed towards the uh, the government bureaucracy as well as to the society so unless we write these challenges it is not possible to give the uh, uh, solutions right so we should highlight these kind of challenges and right uh, promote the sensitization program right so next we move on to the next question that is the question number 8 right question number 8 so which is about direct benefit transfer so this question number 8 revolves around dbt which got introduced in 2013 from January 1st, 2013, this program got started, right? So, it is seen as a major reform initiative in governance, right? Particularly in the field of application of ICT. So, if you take the questions asked in UPSC, last time, question came was, uh, even question was asked on public service delivery, right? Role of uh, pressure groups in public service delivery, right? Now, uh, there was a question asked on role of ICT in uh, digital uh, literacy right so now in this year question was on role of ict in public service delivery so there is no much difference that means upsc is constantly asking this area of application of ict so uh, dbt dbt is right one of the application of ict right using of ict in public service delivery so which is right right which is an initiative to promote Effective, efficient public service delivery, right? Not only effective and efficient, but also time bound delivery of public services, right? So, it is this initiative which is seen as, uh, as an initiative to curb corruption, to curb delays, right? To curb red tape, what you call red tapeism in public service delivery, right? So, it is seen as a re engineering work within the public service delivery all right so definitely all right it is an important initiative so there are uh, uh, even we need to highlight the programs which are really implemented right uh, 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 by union government or different state governments right uh, uh, involving dbt say for example pm kisan so pm kisan uh, is, uh, is one such example right uh, mnrg is one such example a health scheme is another example right so all right uh, uh, we have we have uh, this uh, what you call uh, then we have a uh, uh, prime minister's avas yojana housing for all where benefit is directly transferred so that means dbt has become a watchword in the governance system dbt is a uh, right uh, an innovative scheme right in uh, in ensuring effective governance right so we need to highlight even this uh, uh, programs right a uh, landmark programs of the government but right so for every program for every scheme even there are its own challenges so every scheme has its own challenges so let us talk about some of the limitations of this what you call uh, this a uh, dbt center state coordination because most of the programs you take uh, health issues uh, health programs right education poverty elevation so some of this constitutionally these subjects are either under concurrent list or under state list. So, when they are under this concurrent list or state list, we see involvement of both, uh, what you call, in, uh, involvement of both central states or states, uh, as the case may be. Now, it will be difficult. Now, it is in this case, right, direct benefit transfer will be difficult. Right? So, both state and center, right, are fighting against each other. So, unless there is a coordination, so coordination itself is a biggest limitation in dbt right so banking system so for effective working of dbt we require banking system at the grassroots level right so according to rbi's report so there is a loopholes there are still fundamental uh, loopholes in the physical infrastructure required that is there still loopholes in the presence of banking system at the grassroots level so many villages, majority villages do not have 
what you call banking services at their point. That is, there are no point of services. Lack of, lack of banking services. Second one, right? The kind of uh, a broadband uh, network, right? So broadband connectivity, another issue, all right? So this is uh, what you call. These are the some of the issues which are uh, faced in uh, implementation of DBT. Poor connectivity, infrastructure gaps, right? So lack of automation in the schemes, all right? So these are the major limitations within. Uh, implementation of DBT. Once, if these uh, limitations, so it is not that hard, it is not that difficult to overcome these limitations. So these limitations, if overcome, definitely, definitely, right, DBT, right, will be a revolutionary scheme in India, right. So we should start our answer with the introduction of the program, some of the examples, then bringing the limitations and having a pragmatic conclusion. So we take this ninth question. The ninth question is about India's relations with Sri Lanka. It is about the Indo-Sri Lanka relations. Alright. So if you take this Indo-Sri Lanka relations. Alright. There are two important parts of this question. Right. So let me see the question. India is an age-old friend of Sri Lanka. Discuss India's role in the recent crisis in Sri Lanka. In light of the preceding statement, all right. So, as a friend of Sri Lanka, what is India's role? Remember, it is very clear. India's role of India's role in the recent crisis in Sri Lanka. What is India's role in the recent crisis in Sri Lanka? Right. In the preceding statement, that is, as an age-old friend, what is expected of from India? So, what kind of role is expected from India? So, that should be the question. So, this is asked for 15 marks. So, we can divide this question into two parts. Alright. One for 5 marks and the other one for 10 marks. So, that is, we need to describe the age-old friendship between India and Sri Lanka. So, describe this right uh, uh, for 5 marks. And main part of the question, that is, India's role right in the Sri Lankan crisis. So that is what India has done till now and what is expected in the future. The two elements. All right. So answer this for 10 marks. That means majority part of the answer should be on India's role. But we should also touch right this age old friendship. So we can uh, discuss this uh, first part of the answer from the times of Mauryans. That is the kind of India Sri Lanka relations that were maintained from the times of Mauryans. Ashoka's time, the spread of Buddhism, sending of Indian ambassadors to what you call uh, Sri Lanka to spread Buddhism as a part of what you call uh, uh, policy on Dhamma. Right? So, next, Dhamma Mahatra, Dhamma Mahamatras, appointment of Dhamma Mahatma, uh, appointment of Dhamma Mahamatras, then uh, the kind of relations that we maintain during uh, times of Cholas. Right? So, how Cholas have uh, uh, maintain relations with Sri Lanka. Right? Then, after independence, right? In the importance of Sri Lanka to India's foreign policy as a part of Gujarat's doctrine, as a part of neighborhood past policy. Right? So, all these are different elements. So, we should touch out. Right? Apart from this, so this is the first part of the answer. So, next part of the answer, that is uh, India's role in the Sri Lankan crisis. So, first of all, what India has done till now, right? And what is expected in the future? So, why Sri Lanka is important for India? So, what kind of role that India should play, right? So, now if you take the Sri Lankan crisis, it is important in three important uh, dimensions. One is the China factor, right? Trade of uh, trade with uh, Sri Lanka, then the political instability in Sri Lanka. So. The China factor in India-Sri Lanka relations. The Sri Lankan trade in India-Sri Lanka relations. That is the trade relations. Right? As well as the political instability and its impact on India-Sri Lanka. So, we need to talk about these elements. Right? So the crisis and its consequences. Right? Then, what India has done. So, why India, why Sri Lanka is important? So, in terms of trade. So, this is the 
importance. In terms of security, what is the role of Sri Lanka? In terms of security, why Sri Lanka is important for India? Right? So, we have Indian foreign policy. One of the major objectives of Indian foreign policy is to maintain, protect right, territorial integrity, sovereignty and security of the nation. So, how Sri Lanka is important for India's territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty and security. Right? So, we have seen the issues of uh, LTTE. Then, the civil war in Sri Lanka, the impact of civil war on India-Sri Lanka relations. All right? And the contemporary challenges. All right? So, we should talk about this. All right? Uh, this importance. We will also talk about the importance of Sri Lanka in terms of trade. The political importance of Sri Lanka. The security importance of Sri Lanka. The trade importance of Sri Lanka. All right? So, in three different points. It's over. All right? Now, what India has done. All right? The kind of support given uh, to Sri Lanka. Right? Say, say, for example, as a part of the neighborhood first scheme, right? So, which the present government is following, right? Which is the top priority of the government of India and India's foreign policy. The kind of help that India has given to Sri Lanka, right? So, have given, what do you call? Uh, the financial aid given to Sri Lanka till now, right? The line of credit given to Sri Lanka on different items like kerosene, urea, medicines, food, right? So, we need to highlight these, uh, what you call, uh, a support given by India and what is expected in the future, all right? So, particularly in maintaining political stability, right? As well as in uh, promoting trade with Sri Lanka, all right? So, if you can highlight these points, all right? The answer is more than enough, all right? So, this is the answer for the question asked in question number 11. So, question number 11 is all about the India Sri Lanka relations and the present. Uh, uh, scenario, right? Right. So if if you divide this question, right? If you understand the question and if you can divide accordingly, then writing an answer is very easy, right? So this should be the uh, important part of answer writing. Let us move towards the next question, right? So if you take this next question, the next question is on uh, beam step. Question number ten. In the question paper. So, again, if you see this question, you can see three question marks first, second, and third. That means a question asked for 15 marks. So, we can also divide this question into three parts, right? So, each part should be answered for five marks. So, if you can, uh, if you can do in this way, right? Answer can be written in a pinpointedly, in a precisely, without giving any kind of unnecessary points. All right, and you can expect maximum marks from your answer. All right, so there are three questions, three points. Do you think that Beamstack is a parallel organization like SAR? And remember, question on Beamstack is expected because 20, 22 marks, 25 years of Beamstack, and it is important. So anything. 25 years, 50 years, uh, what you call 10 years, 5 years, any institution, any institution, right? By using this timeline, you can guess the questions in UPSC. Alright. So, do you think that Beamstack is a parallel organization like SAR? First point. What are the similarities and dissimilarities between SARC and what you call Beamstack? How far Indian foreign policy objectives are realized by forming this new organization. Coming to the first part, all right? So, whether Beamstech should be seen as a parallel organization like SARC, all right? So, SARC is our traditional organization. SARC is the traditional regional grouping of India, all right? So, which is meant to protect the interest of countries of South Asian regions, all right? But what is the relevance of SARC? What is the working of SARC? So, we all know that the SARC has failed in its working. SARC has failed in its uh, in achieving its objectives, and we know the reasons for failure of SARC. The uh, what you call the uh, the bilateral relations among the countries, particularly the uh, the, the major countries like India, uh, Pakistan, right? The Pakistan Bangladesh relations, right? The internal strife within these countries, the internal challenges faced by these SARC relations, right? The kind of economic progress. So there are certain internal challenges. 
So as it is only for five marks, we cannot elaborate all these points. But just say that SARG has failed to achieve its objectives by citing one or two factors and not more than that. So as SARC has failed, right? We are searching. So India to protect its uh, in uh, interest to uh, to achieve its what you call uh, objectives. So we need an alternate mechanism. So we have found Beanstack as an alternate to SARC. Right. So this is what the first point. Should uh, Beanstack be seen as a parallel organization to SARC, or should be seen as an alternate to SARC? So whether it is a parallel organization or it is an alternate to SARC. Right. So uh, our conclusion. So Beanstack in the present uh, scenario, Beanstack in the contemporary period, it is more than parallel organization. It is an. It can be seen as alternate to sark right sark is grouping of only south asian countries if it takes a beamstack it consists of countries both from south asia as well as from southeast asian nations right so that is how we can say that beamstack is more than parallel it is an alternate right so this is what the first point right second point right the similarities and dissimilarities between sark and beamstack so bring out Structural as well as the functional similarities, structural and functional similarities and dissimilarities as a structure that is the composition, the structural mechanism that Beamstack and SARC has functions, right? So, SARC is a multilateral uh, system, whereas in Beamstack, importance priority is given to the bilateral uh, what you call uh, initiatives. So, each country is given a specific task. Each country has a specific area of cooperation. Right? Say, for example, in, uh, in the recently concluded summit, India was seen as a security pillar of SARC. That means every country has its own, what you call, a specialty or specific function in the beamstick. So, which is not seen in the uh, SARC. So, when you highlight this kind of, uh, what you call, functional differences, this will become, this will be a value uh, to your answers. So, this is the, these are kind of points which are expected. India sold in Beamstack in promotion of trade, energy, right? energy cooperation, trade cooperation, security cooperation. So, that is what the role of India in Beamstack. So, which is a specific role given to India. So, India has a, a larger role in promoting the cooperation among these countries. Similarly, each country has their own, what you call a specific areas. So, which is the difference from the SARC? In SARC, we don't see this kind of what you call a functions being assigned to the member countries. So, we need to highlight this kind of structural and functional similarities and dissimilarities. So, how far, right, the objectives are achieved, right? So, in terms of security, sovereignty, trade, that is in both uh, what you call Indian Ocean region as well as beyond Indian Ocean region, that is in, even in what you call Indo-Pacific region. So, it promotes both land and maritime trade, security, right? It is, Beamstack is a part, right, which joins South Asia with Southeast Asia. So, in this context, it is important, right? So, India's objectives of protecting sovereignty, security, right, promoting India's interest, particularly the trade interest, energy interest, all they can be achieved by Beamstack, right? So, answer is definitely we can achieve the uh, policy objectives as given by Indian foreign policy. So, this is how you can answer this question. Right? So, when you can easily divide this answer, again, you can pinpointly, precisely, you can make the answer. Right? So, this is the 10th question. Right? Then coming to the 11th question asked in uh, UPSC mains. Right? If you take this 11th question, our 11th question which is on disqualification of MPs and MLAs, members of parliament as well as members of state legislature. Right? Again, if you see this question, there are nearly uh, what you call two to three lines. Right? So, obviously it is a three to four line question here. Now, that means definitely if you look at, at least there will be two or three components in this question. So, let us identify different components of question. Then we will divide our answer. So, division of answer, framing of answer depends upon the way in which the question is articulated. The question itself gives us 
the uh, idea and the flow of answer so let, uh, let me read the question once discuss the procedures to decide the disputes arising out of election of members of the parliament or state legislature under the representation of peoples act 1951 what are the grounds on which the election of any retired candidate may be declared as void the third part is what remedy is available to the aggrieved party against the decision refer to the case laws right so now this is the first part of the question this is the second part of the question and this is the third part of the question again we have three parts in this question so now if you can easily if you can divide this answer into three parts our answer is over so we need to address three issues first issue is procedures to decide the disputes procedure to decide the electoral disputes of mps and mlas first part second part on what grounds the election can be declared as void third part what are remedies available right if there is unconstitutional judgments right answer is over and we need to explain this by using relevant case laws so first of all procedure for deciding the disputes procedure for deciding the electoral disputes originally in our constitution we have article 324 so article 324 before 19th amendment act and after 19th amendment act before uh, what do you call before 19th amendment act right so according to representation to peoples act according to representation to peoples act right the election commission the election commission can decide its own mechanism article uh, article 324 clearly gives this independence to the election commission this power to the election commission so by using the power under article 324 and according to representation of peoples act of 1951 right both parliament and state legislatures are given the power to constitute their own electoral tribunals for deciding any case of any dispute on elections that means originally before 19th amendment act 1966 right so there were electoral tribunals constituted by both parliament and state legislature to decide the electoral tribunals but 19th amendment act 1966 it has abolished this line it has uh, deleted this line from article 324 that means right it is this 19th amendment act has abolished electoral tribunals so now we don't have any such tribunals so all the electoral uh, disputes they are decided by high courts and supreme courts right so they are given to uh, right in case of mls it is high courts in case of uh, what do you call uh, mp it is supreme court right so they are the given this uh, so the, the judiciary is given as uh, what do you call jurisdiction over electoral disputes so this is what the project to decide the disputes are arising out out of it the, the first part is over what kind of procedure is established right so we have supreme court high court and before this we have electoral tribunals right and even we can also use chandra kumar case right where right it is in this case supreme court held that every decision of tribunal can be appealed in high courts then to supreme courts right so that is how we can uh, use this chandra kumar case here right next on what grounds right the election of the candidate can be declared as void so we have three grounds one is uh, sorry we can uh, call it as two grounds one is violation of constitution second one is uh, violation of laws of parliament so violating constitution violating 10th schedule of the constitution that is anti uh, anti defection law both are the grounds for what you call uh, disqualifying so article 102 as well as article 191 of the constitution deals with the grounds for disqualification an mp or mla can be disqualified for violating the constitution they can also be disqualified for violating the representation to peoples act they can also be disqualified for violating the anti defection laws right so recently the allahabad high court has given a judgment on mohammad uh, mohammad azam khan right who got elected right by violating the constitution that is he has uh, got elected without attaining the age of 25 years 
so on this grounds the election of that uh, candidate got uh, the election of that candidate was declared void all right so for violation of constitution that is violating any ground mentioned in constitution is a ground for disqualifying under article 102 or 191 disqualifying under representation to peoples act violation of representation to peoples act all right undischarged insolvent infirmity of mind all right then uh, we have uh, uh, other laws all right so any ground any uh, any violation to uh, representation to uh, people uh, act that is violation of modal code of conduct i'm sorry all right violation of modal code of conduct all right violation of any provision of representation to peoples act uh, one of which includes right getting convicted by a court of law for more than 2 years so any uh, candidate who is convicted right for two or more than two years they can be uh, their election can be declared as void supreme court in lilly thomas versus union of india case right it was in this case all right where supreme court has declared immediate vacation of a seat immediate disqualification and vacation of a seat by uh, election commission so any candidate who is declared as convicted then they should vacate the seat immediately they should be disqualified immediately and they vacate and they should vacate the seat immediately so this is what our supreme court judgment right so we can use this alili thomas case here similarly right uh, a candidate the elected candidate can be declared as void if uh, violating the anti defection law and supreme court has every power to what you call a uh, uh, judicial uh, to have a review on such disqualification so you take ravinaya case rajendra maurya case right uh, ravinaya versus union of india case rajendra maurya versus state of bihar case vishwanathan versus state of tamil nadu case so we have akihoto holahan case all right so it is in these cases all right the uh, disqualification is upheld all right so these are different grounds for right uh, declaring the election as void so this is the second part of the answer all right and third part of the answer what is the remedy available for the aggrieved party So who is aggrieved party here? The aggrieved party here is right the one whose disqualification is done in an unconstitutional manner. That means right if a supreme court, if a court declares that disqualification as unconstitutional, then the disqualified candidate has every power to get that is every power to assume his office. when his disqualification is unconstitutional he has every power he has every right to assume the office office of member of parliament or office of member of state legislature that is the remedy available right a remedy as given as emanates from the law of parliament a remedy that is emanating from the law of parliament right so this is what about the 11th question so we have three parts again you can use this uh, we can let the answer in three parts so here most of the answer should go along the second part that is the grounds for declaring the election as void so if you ask me all right five marks five marks for the first part of the answer all right seven marks for the second part of the answer three marks for the third part of the answer so this is how we can divide the weightage of the answer so if you can if you have the idea a bit of stress in the question then you will easily get the answer so here coming to question number 12 the question number 12 is about the ordinance making power of governor so it is about ordinance making power of governor and there are certain tags used in the question so let us see the question first discuss the essential conditions for exercising the legislative powers by governor discuss the legality of repromulgation of ordinance by governor without placing them before the legislature right so there are two elements there are two elements in this question so first element is about essential conditions for exercising for the exercise of legislative powers by the governor right so here we will use we will discuss the governor's legislative powers by the help of 
ordinance making power so there are other legislative powers also right but here the stress is on ordinance making power of governor right so essential conditions for exercising the legislative powers right so governor is a part of state legislature where as a part of state legislature governor exercises his legislative powers either on the advice of state council of ministers headed by chief minister or on the directions of president of india remember here governor is a, a bridge between center and states so he either acts on the advice of chief minister or on the advice of uh, or, or on the directions of president of india so we should uh, start answer with this point so then going to the article that is the relevant uh, article of indian constitution then going to the uh, necessary conditions right so that is when assembly is not in session or right when both the houses of uh, state legislature are not in session or when either of the two houses of the state legislature is in not in session so there are three conditions right so we need to give this three conditions because the question revolves around these conditions then right re legality of repromulgation of an ordinance so remember our constitution we know that it has uh, our constitution does not bars either the president or governors from issuing the ordinance right so the same ordinance can be repromulgated whenever there are satisfactory conditions that means there should be satisfactory conditions before repromulgating the ordinance right so though the governor has every power to repromulgate the ordinance right so all such repromulgations are subjected to judicial review so supreme court in rc cooper case or in dc badwa case in ir kohlo case upheld the judicial review right and not only there is a judicial safeguard in the form of judicial review but even there is a legislative safeguard what is the legislative safeguard whenever an ordinance is issued by governor that ordinance need to be placed in the floor of the house within the period of 6 weeks right so not only the ordinance but even the conditions requiring for issue the ordinance so we have a legislative safeguard right so there is a clear procedure mentioned in the constitution for placing the ordinance within the legislature so if it is violated then it amounts to violation of constitution right so there cannot be constitutionally speaking there cannot be repromulgation without placing the ordinance within the floor of the house if it is done so then the legality of the ordinance can be questioned in a court of law as said by supreme court in rc cooper case so in rc cooper case supreme court directly held that right the conditions the conditions requiring for the repromulgation of ordinance can be reviewed by supreme court right so this is what about the second part that means discuss the legality of repromulgation of ordinance without placing them before the legislature so if it is not placed before legislature then there is no legality for such ordinance as said by supreme court so this should be our answer right so very simple answer if it is all right if you can clearly uh divide this question all right let us move to the next question all right so coming to next question that is question number 13 right so question number 13 it is about working of indian federation all right a very commonly expected area for ups exam right so as long as we write ups exam so this should never be forgotten right so question is on working of indian federation right so let me read the question while the national political parties in india favor centralization the regional parties are in favor of state autonomy right so national political parties they favor centralization regional parties right they favor autonomy that is they favor autonomy from the control of center right so here from where to start our answer obviously it is from article 1 so how article 1 describes india right the role of center and the the nature of center and the 
nature of states right so we all know that our indian constitution has established right a union with federal futures an indestructible union with destructible states that means center has every power every control over the states right now it is from this center control states are demanding right so there is a claim for autonomy right a claim for autonomy in three major areas one is autonomy in the taxation powers so states are demanding right a more tax because uh, powers because of their increased growing administrative functions the states are burdened with the growing administrative functions to or to meet their requirements states are demanding right more taxation powers and after the impact after the uh, emergence of gst we see a kind of a change in the fiscal federalism of india right so a balance between central states got uh, what to call uh, a change because of this uh, gst right so it is uh, uh, states have complained that some of states have complained that they have, they have lost their uh, powers not only gst but even the recommendations of 15th finance commission the recommendation of finance commission so which have what do you call uh, uh, which have brought a disadvantage to those states where, where there is a balance of where, where there is a stimulation of population so we have seen some of the states in india particularly the southern states have protested against the finance commission recommendations and they they protested that they have lost their <coughs> i'm sorry so they have lost their uh, financial powers right so because of gst because of finance uh, because of the recent finance commission recommendations right so there is a claim right there is a cry from the states so now states are demanding for what you call uh, autonomy in the taxation powers another area is right assertion of linguistic and cultural rights right so there is a debate on a compulsory imposition of hindi right so that is using of hindi and the debate on the usage of national language particularly the regional parties it is regional parties right which have uh, 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 which have voiced their concerns against right imposing this national language right so regional language or uh, regional uh, regional political parties they want to give importance to their own language so that is they are not in favor of that right, imposing this hindi over them right similarly there was uh, there was an issue of uh, national education policy right so hindi as a subject right in the uh, being imposed through national education policy so regional uh, political parties regional political parties have protested against this element so definitely we can see that uh, uh, we can imagine that this question is framed right based upon that backdrop right Big, uh, based upon the backdrop of states protest against the uh, what do you call uh, particularly using of hindi and hindi in national education policy right right and the cultural rights right power of parliament to make laws right and that uh, such laws are imposed in every states right except those states which are protected under article 371 right so there is uh, we have article 371 there is where uh, special provisions are made for this states all right so that is imposition of a common culture right again it is protested by regional parties say for example the issue of jalikattu all right so there was a decision taken to ban jalikattu which is been protested all right so now these are the issues right from which the states want the autonomy all right so now in this backdrop so what is the survivability of indian federation so we need to comment on survivability of indian federation and we need to talk about the different constitutional mechanisms that were given to protect the indian federation right so this is what is expected in the answer right so we have seen how states are been what you call uh, uh, how how uh, states independence and autonomy has been compromised by using article 356 the role of governor right in using of article 356 as well as the role of governor in uh, appointment of the government as well as removal of government right so all this we can use to show that states are losing their autonomy and we, right at the same time we can also use uh, what you call the recommendations given by 
the first ARC, MM Fonchi Committee, or you take, uh, what do you call, uh, the uh, SR Bumai case, Supreme Court uh, guidelines, Supreme Court judgment in SR Bumai case in using of Article 356 or right on the working of uh, governor, right? And even we can also use, right, the first center state relations committee, right? That is, uh, Sarkari committee recommendations. So you can use any of these so that, right, to, uh, right, uh, to explain, right, uh, the case for maintaining the autonomy of the states at the same time having the what you call uh, balance between center and states right so that should be our answer for this question so coming to the next question the next question is on right uh, uh, that is uh, question number 14 critically examine the procedures through which the presidents of india and france are elected right so we have the topic of compared to constitutions in paper 2, right? And recently we have seen both India and the France bent for elections. That is, there was uh, the election of president in uh, the election of president of France was held in the month of February. That is just after the uh, Ukraine war and we have seen the election of president of India. So, uh, obviously, we should, uh, we should expect this area of election of president of India, at least. If not, uh, election, of, uh, uh, election of president of France so we should expect a question definitely on the uh, president election because previously UPSC has asked this area, right? So it is, uh, there is no surprise in asking this question, right? So let us talk about this uh, question. The question is simple, critically examine. The question is very simple, critically examine the procedures, right? So, we need to examine the procedures. So, what do you mean by critical examination here? We need, right, what is a critical examination here? Simply, it is about how a comparison between the election of President of India as well as election of President of France, right? So, as we all know, we are well aware about the election of President of India, that is the manner of election. So, right from Article 54, 55, 56, right, we, we should, uh, right, uh, right, if possible, try to mention all the uh, uh, articles or uh, uh, right, uh, go for the uh, manner of election of President of India, the conditions for uh, electing the President of India. And here, the stress should be on the manner of election, right? So, uh, try to give information about the qualifications required, right? And, but most focus should be on manner of election. So, that is the President of India being elected indirectly by people of India through the Electoral College, so the Composition of Electoral College, the majority required to elect the President of India. That is, uh, here in India, we require a majority of 50% plus one vote, 50% uh, plus one vote of all the total valid polls. All right. So that is what the procedure for, uh, what you call, electing the President. The single transferable vote. All right. The proportional representation, the single transferable vote. So we need to mention all these elements in the answer. So here, the first part of the answer should be about, about providing the basic facts of electing the president of India, all right? So, which is very simple to answer. Second part, we need to also provide what you call uh, election of uh, what you call president of France and then we should compare. Say for example, so there are two things that is right, before 1962 and after 1962 because it was in 1962 the French constitution was amended bringing changes in the mode of election of president right so before 1962 the election of president of France was almost all similar to India it is similar to India that is the president of France was also elected in an indirect manner right by an electoral college consisting of members of parliament that is the members of national that is the national representatives so in india it is mps there it is what you call national representatives the members of local bodies right that is in india we not only have mps but also we see participation of mls right representatives of representatives in the overseas territories that is in the uh, french administered areas right so there is an so it is common the commonest lies in indirect election the commonest lies in having electoral college and there is some commonality in the composition of electoral college, 
So this is the commonness between the election of friend of India as well as France. Right? But difference came out after 1962. After 1962, the French president is elected right, directly. That is, he is elected by the people of France directly on the principle of universal adult franchise. Right? So it is universal, uh, it is universal suffrage which is used. And absolute majority out of all the candidates, the one who secures absolute majority, they are regarded as what you call the winning candidate. If there is no absolute majority for any candidate, then there will be a second poll. That is, in case in first poll, if there is no absolute majority achieved, then in the second poll, right, the top two candidates, the top two uh, candidates in the total number of contesting candidates, they will go for second poll. That is, it is called as second ballot. Second ballot will be held among the top two candidates, right? Then, right, there will be election. So, the one who secures the maximum number of votes in the second ballot, they will be declared as a winning candidate. So, in India, it is once for all. In India, the procedure is, if there is no majority required, that is, if a candidate fails to get the majority, we see what you call uh, uh, votes being shared between uh, what you call the different candidates. The votes of, the first preference votes of, the, uh, the least candidate, they have been shared. Then the second preference votes. So that is how we keep on sharing the votes. And out of, that is after each and every round, the one who first secures 50% plus one vote, 50% plus one vote, they are declared as the winning candidate. The one who secures this majority first, they are declared as winning candidate. But in France, it is not the case. Right? If there is no majority, then there should be a second poll. That is, there should be a second ballot. The second ballot will be held between the top two candidates. And it is in the second ballot, the French president is decided. Right? So, this is what about the election of French president and the, the similarities and differences between the Indian president as well as French president election. Similarity was there before 1962, but in 19, uh, after 1962, we see a change. Right? So this should be the answer, right? So I feel it difficult because uh, particularly for non-public administration students, so this is a difficult part, right? But, uh, right? Not only public administration, but even the candidates from law optional or the candidates of political science, they can answer this question because we have a topic of comparative uh, law, comparative politics, comparative public administration, right? So we will we will compare, right? Uh, uh, these political institutions with the other political institutions, all right? So the people who have this optional, definitely, uh, I would expect them to write a, a very good answer. Come into the next question. Coming to question number 15, all right? So the question number 15 is on what you call modal code of election commission and its role after uh, what you call modal code of conduct, all right? So that is simply, how model code of conduct has brought a what call role change in election commission, right? So whether this uh, moral code of conduct, whether it has uh, strengthened election commission or it has weakened election commission, right? So that is what we should uh, ultimately answer. So evol that is election commission role uh, role of election commission in the, light, in the light of evolution of model code of conduct. The obvious answer is. Right, this model code of conduct right, has strengthened the working of election commission. Today, election commission is in a position to really act as a watchdog of a democracy. Remember, if you take this election commission, the role of election commission is to act as a watchdog of democracy. So that means it can act as a watchdog of democracy by only conducting free and fair election. So this free and fair election is possible only when there is a code of conduct. Only when there is a code of conduct to the political parties. Right? So the, uh, the obvious conclusion for this question is, the, the, uh, the obvious conclusion for this question is, right, it has strengthened, it has strengthened the working of election commission and which is required, which is required. So our answer should definitely start from the relevant articles. Article 324, Article 326, as well as Article uh, Article 325, Article 327, 
All these articles have empowered the election commission to make rules, to, to conduct free and fair elections, to, uh, to supervise elections, to regulate political parties during elections. Right? And it has also given the power to the parliament and state legislatures right, to, uh, to come with a laws, right? all those laws which are essential for conducting free and fair elections. A democracy, the survival of a democracy depends upon conducting of free and fair elections. So our constitution has clearly uh, uh, empowered not only the election commission but also the parliament and the council state legislature to come with the necessary laws. So our uh, answer should start from this point. Then what is model code of conduct? All right. So if you can recollect or if you have information, do also uh, what you call trace out the origin of Evolution of model code of, model code of conduct. That is, as the question specifically talks about evolution of model code of conduct, then we can go back to the times of 1962 as well as 1978-79. So it was during this period, it was for the first time in 1962, the election commission has brought a model code of conduct, which later got strengthened in 1979. So from that, right, that is over a period of time, the uh, election commission brought on, uh, it, uh, it has uh, went on bringing changes to this uh, model code of conduct. Ultimately, today, right, we are, election commission is able to ensure free and fair elections as well as regulate the political parties. That is, what are to be required to be done, that is do's and do nots. Alright, so now how this, what you call, uh, uh, model code of conduct is enforced, how it is implemented. Uh, mention uh, uh, mention few lines about this uh, working of what you call implementation of model code of conduct and if possible do also write some of the projects of model code of conduct right whatever you you remember right so in one or two three points right not more than that right so see which is uh, what you call a modern application so whenever we write an answer we should also bring some kind of current affairs into the part as well as as it is an answer uh, dealing with the polity asked or not but still it is our duty to mention right, uh, what you call at least one relevant case study right so it is only then right we can bring the answer we can have a full-fledged answer so main, uh, providing the constant provisions right giving the current examples giving, uh, giving the relevant case class if you are if you are uh, if you can provide these three informations basic information think that you'll get a maximum amount of marks right so we have doctrine of basic structure of constitution where one of the elements of doctrine of base structure of constitution is to conduct free and fair elections. All right. So we can use this case that is Rajnavi versus Indira Gandhi case. All right. So if you can uh, if you can provide this case study, I think uh, it is more than enough a well established case study. All right. So our uh, the ultimate conclusion is this model code of conduct has strengthened the working of election commission right not only strengthen the working of election commission but also conclude that it has strengthened the democratic system of india question number 16 right so the question number 16 is about inflation and poverty right so if you take this uh, question so let me read the question once besides welfare schemes india needs debt management of inflation and employment to serve the poor and underprivileged sections of the society all right discuss all right so now as it is a question about poverty so normally we should start our answer about the basic facts about poverty that is the incidence of poverty that is what do you call the amount of poverty in india so if you can provide the basic statistics then your answer looks good all right so provide some statistics right the total amount, the average poverty in india the urban poverty the rural poverty right so then go to the question right so now inflation the question is about the effect of the effect of inflation on poverty not only inflation there are two things right inflation and unemployment Inflation and unemployment. So, if you are good in economy, then you can you can uh, use the Phillips curve. 
all right the philips curve these uh, what you call the stagnation all right so now bring out the relation of inflation on poverty as well as unemployment on poverty so you can also bring out the effect of inflation on unemployment and the uh, what you call the combined effect on poverty that is the combined effect of inflation and unemployment on poverty right so when inflation increases that is obviously the purchasing power decreases right so inequality will increase it uh, lowers the minimum wages right not only minimum wages right the all these things that is consumption expenditure will come down the cost of living becomes burdensome right so there will be stagnancy in employment so all these are the cumulative effects right so inflation will definitely what you call uh, promote or in, uh, uh, inflation will definitely increase poverty and recently we have seen the uh, effect of covid so covid not only increased inflation but at the same time it has brought it has also led to increased poverty right so we should first talk about the effect the uh, effect of inflation so inflation as a causing factor for poverty so we need to bring a different dimensions of what called inflation it is only then we can uh, say why management of inflation and unemployment is important right so that is what the uh, crux of the answer right so you can write an answer if you can really establish the uh, relation between inflation and unemployment on poverty right so right uh, this is about the 16th question next we move on to the next question 17th question the 17th question is on donor agencies right emergence of donor agencies and their impact on community participation donor agencies and community participation all right so this is what the question is all right so now we are required to justify our answer justify your answer the very first question is with with the emergence of donor agencies whether community participation has increased or not there are two way effects in some of the cases we have seen donor agencies have promoted community participation donor agencies have encouraged the local uh, uh, local groups particularly the civil societies voluntary organizations and in implementing different particular welfare schemes right so the one side of the coin is right so donor agencies have promoted community participation right say for example implementation of naco right implementation of swajal dara implementation of rural water schemes rws so all these are so if we take naco naco is funded by what call bill gates foundation right so if we take uh, uh, this swajal dara and rws they are funded by unicef right so we have what you call uh, operation blackboard all right so operation blackboard very popular program all right so which is funded by uh, and this uh, un agency all right so it is this un uh, uh, it is united nations development program right which has uh, funded this uh, operation blackboard that means right all these are the programs which are successfully implemented because of people participation because of community participation all right so we we are, we, are, we are able to control uh, aids we are able to promote provide our uh, what call uh, water drinking water at the rural areas because of local participation because of participation of community agencies because of participation of village panchayats and these are the programs which are sponsored and funded by international donor agencies all right and even we have the local donor agencies which are involved in empowerment programs providing of infrastructure at the grassroots level ajim prem ji foundation bicon foundation right so you can use these kind of examples to justify that 
donor agencies are right uh, the one who actually encourage right a uh, people participation in the form of civil societies or community based organizations or the uh, what do you call uh, css cbos or voluntary organizations but at the same time there is other side of the coin right so there are donor agencies which acted which worked for cross purpose that is there that is those agencies that which had right uh, what do you call asserted their self interest those had a partisan objectives those nr those donor agencies which have used themselves right which have used uh, what do you call ngos or uh, civil societies for diversion of funds right so they are uh, donor agencies manipulating vivos and uh, ngos so the other side of the coin is donor agencies worked for their self interest right donor agencies have used ngos or civil societies for diverting the funds right for uh, what do you call uh, what do you call uh, to evade attacks uh, to evade taxes right so this is the other side of the coin but we have in india right we have a legal mechanism where these kind of tendencies are created uh, what called regulated so even also talk about the uh, what do you call regulatory mechanism regulatory mechanism that is evolved in india particularly the fcra the foreign contribution regulation act so all those contributions all those contributions about 10 lakhs now they are under the scanner of government so without the permission of government there cannot be any kind of contribution there cannot be any kind of funding so this is how the government of india has evolved a legal mechanism to control this donor agencies which are uh, which are uh, 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 working against the spirit of community participation right so our answer should be a two sided that is how uh, this donor agencies have promoted uh, community participation and how uh, they have misused the community participation or how they have misused the people organizations right so this is what about this 17th question moving to the next question that is 18th question so the question is on right to education act the question is on right of children to free and compulsory education act 2009 remains inadequate right in promoting the incentive based system right for children's education without generating any without generating awareness about the importance of schooling all right so right to information act sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry right to education right to education act 2009 all right the purpose of this right to education act of 2009 is to promote free and compulsory education for all the children below the age of 14 years this is one thing it has provided the right for every child At the same time it has made it mandatory to reserve 25% of the seats in the uh, what call in the unaided schools right for the socially and educationally backward classes socially and educationally weaker sections of the society that is there is a 25% reservations even in private schools even private schools are required to what do you call uh, reserve this the question says is that this act has failed to create an incentive based system to promote schooling that is there is no incentive either to the child or to parents or to schooling so when we talk about incentives so incentive to whom incentive to the child incentive to the parents incentive to the schools right so right so this is what the area is so this right to education act has failed to provide any incentive based system for the children right children's education right the amount of what do you call uh, the amount of what do you call benefit that a child is getting the amount of benefit that a parent is getting right the amount of benefit that school is getting right the three dimensions right so now with this right uh, with this uh, what do you call uh, right to education act it has been made mandatory it has been made, uh, it, it, it has been made mandatory for providing 25% of reservations where right because of this we see migration from 
public schools to private schools because of this provisions right there is a migration of students there is a migration of uh, uh, pupil from public schools to what to call uh, private schools one point now one of the element one of the element of right to education act is to reduce the teacher to pupil ratio that is there should be a parity between the uh, uh, teacher and the number of a uh, school what to call a pupil reducing this a uh, gap right reducing the ratio that means what the state is required to the state is required to establish more number of schools in the same locality right so that is what the point is right that is now when children are moving from public school to private schools what is the point how government will be encouraged to create more number of schools in the same locality so it will become a burden some for the government it is normally when there is no uh, what you call uh, children then right there is no point in creating the schools there is no point in uh, what you call in providing the infrastructure it is simply seen as a waste of expenditure when children are not coming then there is no point in establishing the schools the school buildings remain idle the infrastructure remains idle this is what we call this is what the uh, what you call uh, 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 what you call uh, anti elements within this right to education act on one hand we are saying that right there is there should be a reservation in private schools right now if that is the case on the other hand we are saying that right there should be decrease in the ratio so when when we see both they counteract with each other both these elements are counteracting to each other because when children move to private schools then there is no point in establishing public schools and government state is not required this is one thing right that is the reason why most of the schools are getting closed right so now the point is now if you take this private schools these private schools are forced to provide what you call our reservations the what is the incentive they are getting what is the kind of support they are getting all right so uh, what do you call the uh, payment of fees the re the reimbursement of fees from the government is not in time the governments uh, particularly state governments the state governments are not reimbursing the school fees in time that means what the schools are not receiving the uh, fees in time when they don't receive the fees in time no school can run right so this is another drawback so when there is no reimbursement in time then it will be a discouragement for the schools right so low learning outcomes here there is another interesting point right right to education right to education has brought what to call uh, it has brought compulsory schooling now if you take from the side of parents particularly in the rural areas or those parents who are sending their uh, children to the uh, schools the purpose is to reduce their burden of providing that is reducing the burden of expenditure in providing the uh, uh, what do you call uh, the uh, food and the uh, related uh, nutritious things so mid day scheme uh, mid day meal scheme mid day meal scheme has proved to be the effective program here it is effective because as there is a nutritious food given to the uh, children right most of the children in the rural areas right they are been sent only for this incentive so here incentive is from the mid day meal the incentive is from the what do you call food that is given but what about the learning outcomes later learning outcomes are not been given adequate importance parents don't give that is parents are not able to understand the importance of schooling the importance of learning outcomes when compared to the importance of this mid day meal scheme or the nutritious food being given in the schools that is low learning outcomes right now this as i said as states are uh, what do you call obligated to establish schools right so over a period of time this obligations will become right this obligations will become a financially unviable right so that is there won't be any incentive for the government or schools or children right because of the right to uh, what do you call uh, education act right so what is required is 
there is a need to increase awareness among all these aspects particularly the learning outcomes right the responsibilities of these uh, private schools right as well as right a uh, focusing on providing more hygienic environment for those children who are been uh, taken on the basis of reservations right so this should be the uh, what you call uh, 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 a part of the answer right so let us now move towards the next question the next question is on i2 u2 so normally expected age of our uh, upsc means right so the one who is what you call a uh, strong in syllabus the one who is strong in the current affairs they will not miss any question right so what are the most the most important highlights in newspaper right and traditional areas from the what you call a uh, syllabus right so all they are touched right so how will i2 u2 grouping transform india's position in global politics right so the benefit that india gets from this i2 u2 obviously it is a grouping consisting of middle east countries we have israel we have what you call uh, what you call uae the the most important key players in middle east we have us a superpower of the world so now if you take this grouping and if you take uh, india india is an emerging superpower and as an uh, as an important player in the what you call uh, indian ocean region as well as in the asian uh, among the asian countries right so both in south asia as well as southeast asia so india has an adequate importance so now this grouping how it uh, benefits india first of all politically india can enter into the what you call middle east right it can uh, what you call uh, increase its interaction with the regional as well as international powers right right it can uh, it can uh, it can secure its interest particularly in the middle east because middle east is always important for india in terms of its energy security right so we have energy security as well as right uh, what you call geopolitically it is very important so we see a new being, that is uh, the alliance between uh, china russia iran right so <laughs> the us uh, what do you call <laughs> sorry all right the us uh, russia and china's rivalry going on so how india can use us right what do you call us and uh, in, in particular in containing china all right so it is an important uh, what do you call uh, area that is india's interest lies in what do you call balancing these superpowers all right similarly right what do you call we have iran so today we have this china iran nexus uh, particularly which is important for india india is more concerned about the iran china nexus so how this i2u2 can be uh, can be can be seen it can be used right to counteract or to control right the uh, what do you call iran acting against uh, india right so uae or israel right which are an, again an important players in controlling this iran right so regionally geopolitically this i2 u2 is important right so in terms of trade so in terms of trade uh, clean energy or food security or uh, what you call uh, waste management right so that is that is this, so this is the importance of what you call uh, i2 u2 so here you should highlight right what should dominate geo economics versus geopolitics right so i2 u2 is important in both the ways that is geopolitical it is important as well as geo economical it is important but here right geopolitics should not thwart should not hinder the geo economics right so we should bring out the importance of i2 u2 particularly in achieving the india's foreign policy objectives right so this i2 u2 is traditionally it is uh, it is even called as the middle east quad or the west asian quad that is it is always uh, compared with the quad grouping all right so we should bring out the importance of i2 u2 and how far india can achieve its foreign policy objectives by this itu2 so that should be the
crux of the answer. Right? Coming to the next question. Next question is on what you call India's changing policy towards climate change right, in various international fora right, in the context of geopolitics. Describe briefly about India's changing policy. So how Indian how India's policy on climate change has changed over a period of time and what is the significance of this change in policy geopolitically right? so in the international fora. So we have that is, we have adopted a national action plan on climate change, right? So, we need to highlight the importance of this national action plan of climate change where? So, we are moving from fossil fuels to what you call renewable energy. So, 2022 marks, right, the last year of achieving the goals of national solar mission, right, we have. National Solar Mission, right? Right. That is National Solar Alliance, right? Which is a part of our what you call commitment to clean energy. So we should. That is uh, uh, the reason for asking this question is that it is this 2020, which is the last year in achieving the what you call policy objectives, right? So uh, our uh, commitment towards renewable energy, our commitment towards clean energy, right? So that is what India's policy objective. So without uh, undermining India's national interest, without uh, what you call uh, downgrading India's national interest, right? Our energy policy, our en uh, energy policy, our energy policy has balanced both India's uh, national interest as well as the international commitments. So we never act against the international commitment, or we never undermine ourselves in terms of achieving our goals. So, right from what do you call signing of Kyoto Protocol from Rio Earth Summit, Rio Earth Summit. So, that is from from Rio Earth Summit till date. So, we have conference of parties. That is from how India's policy on uh, climate change got changed from. From conference of parties 1 to conference of parties 27. So today we are seeing the 27th uh, what you call conference of parties. So over a bit of time, how India's energy policy got transformed. So this is how, right, from 2005 to 2010, what is the policy of India? From 2011 to 2015, what is the policy of India? Right, that is from 1988 to 2005, what is the policy of India? Right, so right from the Brutland Commission's report, that is the uh, uh, riot summit, right from riot summit till date, how India's policy got changed. So we need to highlight this change in the policy because our crux of the question is on India's changing policy towards climate change. All right. So the recently signed the Paris Accord. So why, how Paris Accord is important for India and what are the measures taken by government of India towards implementing the Paris Accord. All right. So we should highlight these points.